um, these two uh, readings. So the first one is God's disciples. Um, sorry. Uh, the first one is God disciplines his sons. That's from Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 11. <coughs> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and, in, and the sin that is so easily entangles, and let us run with pers perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that the word of encouragement had addressed you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he, has, he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegit illegitimate <coughs> children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirit and live? Our fathers disciplined us and for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good. And, we, and that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by us, by it. Peace and joy in Romans 5 verses 1 to 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in, in our sufferings because we know, of, we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, very rarely, Will anyone die for the righteous man? Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Estelle. Uh, let's pray before we come to look at those words together. Gracious God, we thank you. Uh, thank you for your great love for us, your grace poured out upon us, so that we might indeed be your children. Lord, as we come to uh, explore these words that you've given us, may we be attentive to your voice uh, as we listen together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so yes. So this morning we've had the joy of baptising Rufus. It's been excellent. We've already talked about how important baptism is in our life together as God's church. And of course Rufus individually too. 
I said before, it's not just a, uh, baptism isn't just a magic sprinkle to make a person special. It's not even magic water involved. You can guarantee it. Ali got it out of the tap just before we started. It, but it is a symbol of three very important things. The Rufus parents acknowledge that before anyone else, this little boy belongs to Jesus, who lived, died, arose again for him. It's a symbol that Rufus' parents are committed to starting him off on, a, on the best life he possibly could, on a life of following Jesus. And it's also a symbol that we all welcome Rufus as part of our church together. Now, it's not unusual at baptisms for people to give gifts. Don't worry. Don't worry if you haven't brought anything. It's uh, not, not, not a big problem. Uh, in fact, most people usually don't. But some people do. I guess it probably depends on the kind of relationship you might have with Rufus. No? Perhaps if you come this morning and you don't really know Rufus' family, then maybe you, you didn't even know that Rufus was getting baptised today. And you might not have given, uh, given him anything at all, and that's fine. Perhaps you know the Nathala family a little bit. So maybe you might offer them a card or something like that. Or maybe you know them really, really well, and you know like Rufus, and you could grown to love him a lot in the very short time he's been with us. And you're really happy that he's going to grow up knowing that God loves him and will learn to follow him all his life. Then you might give him a precious gift of some kind. And we do, we do that together as a church today. So what about God? What does God give Rufus or us when we, we were baptised or came to Christ for doing that? For making such a commitment or having it made on our behalf? And here it is. This is the, uh, this is the gift. Hope. We get hope. That's right, the opportunity to keep hanging on to faith no matter what might go right or go wrong. Because we have hope. But what does hope do? No, Rufus isn't terribly old at this stage. And he can't sort of play with it. As he grows up, he won't be able to read it. He might be able to read about it. Or even just keep it hanging on his wall. How do you know and enjoy this hope? This precious gift of God? And the answer to that is in the previous chapter, the one we've heard today. In Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. You know, at first glance, that looks even worse. Not only is it intangible, you also can't see it. But isn't that the nature of hope? Isn't it something we're waiting on for it to appear? And we look forward to that happening? So what makes this hope so good? Let's look at just two reasons that it is such a great gift. The first one is, it's not going to disappoint us. The hope that has been offered for Rufus and, for all of, and to all of us is absolutely bankable. Some of you will know that I used to be an accountant. I'm recovering, it's going well. But one day, one of my new clients came in and he told me that he had actually been swindled. He was given some advice from a friend to invest in a forest, to grow trees for building purposes. Sounded wonderful. He loves trees. And his friend was pretty convincing, but by the time I met my new client, he had nothing to show for the investment that he'd made. And the loan he'd taken out for it was still costing him money. His hopes have been totally disappointed. But our second reading, in our second reading, we're told that our faith in God leads to hope. A hope that will not, will never disappoint us. How can that be? How will we be so sure that that hope will be ours one day? That it will actually be realised for us? And the answer is because of the one who promises it. 
the one who is Lord of heaven and earth, who has power over all things and works them all for the good of those who love him. The one who did not even hold back his son to die for you and me and all of us so that we could be forever part of his family, his children, in fact, his heirs who look forward to the day when he will call us home to him. He can make these great promises because he has the power to ensure that he can fulfil them. And because he has already shown how much he loves his children through Jesus, his son and our Lord. On top of that, as it says in verses 2 and 3 of our reading, there are so many who have held on to their faith in that hope and have already received the goal of that hope. If that were the sample size of one or two, you would question it. But there are so many in chapter 11 that that author writes of that it's almost ridiculous to deny that faith. It is many, many, many people over time. So we can hold on to that hope because it is so wonderful and because the one who promises it will keep it. But there's a second reason that we should hang on to that hope. It's going to help us in the tough times. You know, there can be rugged times in our family relationships or friendships, can't they? Perhaps finding work, school, or uh, finding school hard, or perhaps work, or sometimes even retirement's really hard, isn't it? Health problems, financial problems, times when you feel hurt or afraid or just sad. But Hebrews isn't just talking about things that isn't talking about things that just happen. It's talking in particular when those things happen because we believe in Jesus and follow him. So we have to ask the question, why would you persevere if that could all go wrong, so horribly wrong for you? And the answer is, it's one of the ways that God shapes us out of his love for us. I wonder if you can relate to this image of siblings that I found the other day. <laughs> uh, sadly, I can. <laughs> when I was younger, I wasn't a great fan of my little sister. She was also always so good, doing all the right things, being obedient. And that was only bad because I was not so obedient. I was pushing the limits a little more. And I wasn't being as good as I probably could be. And I didn't like the fact that she kept on showing me up. And back then, I thought that if my parents really loved me, they wouldn't discipline me for doing the things that I was doing. They wouldn't punish me at all. But they did. My goodness. And that made me think twice before doing it again, which was good. But that doesn't mean that I stopped doing the wrong thing. But I did do them less and less as time went on, and I tried a bit harder. If I kept on going as I was, if my parents hadn't told me off and sometimes punished me for doing the wrong thing, I'm convinced that I would not have done nearly as much as I have, as well as I have, and, or as well as I have, and become what I have. What is more, my sister and I have actually become good friends. Something we were both missed now if my parents hadn't stepped in because they loved both of us so much. But even more than that, if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have shown me grace. And through that, I came to know why God loved me so much and how he had loved me so much. When we experience hard times for our faith, God doesn't do it because he wants us to lose our faith. He uses it so that we will hang on to it all the more firmly because it is so precious. And not only that, but to keep on making us even better and even stronger followers of his, by his strength, by his grace. Challenges aren't supposed to be things that make us lose our faith. They are supposed to, they are purposed to strengthen it. Verse 10 and 11, it tells us, our human fathers correct us for a short time. And they do it as they think best. 
But God, God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. God's doing it so that our faith will become stronger. So we'll come to know him more. And as it says in, in, uh, one, in 2 Corinthians, our strength is made perfect. Sorry, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. But what about those times when we suffer and it isn't because of our faith? It isn't God's will that it happens. But he still can do some great work through it if we let him. Again, coming back from those verses from Romans chapter 5. We know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. So our suffering does again make us stronger. And our stronger actually makes us better people, better followers of, God, of Christ. And in that, as we come to know it and become more resilient in it, our hope grows within us and eventually will be realised fully when we see God face to face. But even now, we are strengthened because the Holy Spirit, God, is still with us along the way. So I'm finishing, we can know that our hope is well worth holding on to because it will not be broken, because it will help us get through the toughest times we will face. Most of all, because it is a hope of life forever, of a place in God's precious family and his spirit will be with us always to ensure it right to the very end. And so we never, ever forget. May we pray that for ourselves. And may we pray that for Rufus. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to, um, to be having this grace of yours unleashed upon us. That it's guaranteed by your own word, a word that cannot be broken. That it is there in the tough times the times when we struggle to hold our heads up. You, Lord, are our strength. And Lord, we thank you that it is a rich hope that you have placed in our hearts. Lord, be with us by your spirit. Continue to grow us, to enrich us in your spirit as, as people who know your love. And Lord, may that hope abound in us more and more as the day approaches. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.